We're looking at the book of Jeremiah. And one of the reasons Jeremiah had to be written was to explain why Jerusalem was going to fall. In fact, if you go back to the short historical introduction to the book that's found in chapter 1, verses 1 through 3, we saw already that it tells us who Jeremiah is and where he came from, but how does it end? It says, It came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, and until the end of the 11th year of Zedekiah, the son of Josiah, king of Judah, until the captivity of Jerusalem in the fifth month. And in case you missed it, and I'm sure you didn't, it's that last phrase, captivity of Jerusalem, that I want you to note. The book begins by talking about the captivity of Jerusalem. And if we fast forward all the way to the last chapter of Jeremiah, we see that it ends with a description of the fall of Jerusalem. So this is a big deal. And I think it's actually hard for most of us to appreciate how significant a statement that would have been for the Jewish people in Jeremiah's day. But let's take a moment and try to get an idea at least of how surprising it is to see that particular phrase, the captivity of Jerusalem. Listen to what Psalm 48 says about Jerusalem. Great is the Lord and greatly to be praised, his holy mountain. Beautiful in elevation is the joy of all the earth. Mount Zion in the far north, the city of the great king. Within her citadels, God has made himself known as a fortress. This is God's city. He's the king and he's made himself known in Jerusalem. Psalm 132, 13 and 14. For the Lord has chosen Zion. It's another name for Jerusalem. He has desired it for his dwelling place. God wanted Jerusalem to be his home. This is my resting place forever, he says. Here I will dwell, for I have desired it. God wants Jerusalem. Now Isaiah 49, 14 and 16. But Jerusalem said, Zion said, The Lord has forsaken me. The, my Lord has forgotten me. Behold, I've engraved you on the palms of my hands, God responds. Jerusalem says, you don't remember me. God says, how can I forget you? I've tattooed you on my hands. Zechariah 1.14. So the angel who talked with me said, cry out. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I am exceedingly jealous for Jerusalem and for Zion. God loved Jerusalem, which means people had to be asking, how could this city fall? That, that didn't make sense to them to think about the city falling. Jeremiah explains, and he explains that it's not because of some problem in God. As one introduction to Jeremiah puts it, his task was to hammer home the message that Jerusalem's fall was not due to any lack on God's part, but was due entirely to Judah's unfaithfulness towards God, specifically by listening to false prophets rather than true ones. In other words, the fall of Jerusalem wasn't because God was unable to protect his city, the opposite. Jeremiah wants to help us understand that what's happening is part of God's sovereign plan. In the very first chapter of Jeremiah, he predicts the fall of Jerusalem and explains it before it happens, which shows us that the fall was not an accident, but the outcome of ignoring God's word. In other words, the death of Israel in exile was not something unforeseen, but a consequence of disobedience. Jeremiah works hard to prove that the exile is the opposite of unforeseen. And he goes back to the book of Deuteronomy to show them that this is exactly what God warned would happen. Deuteronomy 28, what does Moses tell Israel here? The Lord will bring a nation against you from far away, from the end of the earth, swooping down like an eagle, a nation whose language you do not understand, a hard-faced nation who shall not show respect to the old or mercy to the young. The Lord will scatter you among all peoples from one end of the earth to the other, and there you shall serve gods of wood and stone, which neither you nor your fathers have known. And among these nations you shall find no respite, and there shall be no resting place for the sole of your foot. But the Lord will give you there a trembling heart and failing eyes and a languishing soul. Your life shall hang in doubt, before you, night and day, you shall be in dread and have no assurance of your life. In the morning you shall say, if, if only it were evening. And at evening you shall say, if only it were morning. Because of the dread that your heart shall feel and the sights that your eyes shall see. So Jeremiah is written to help godly Israelites know, big picture, God's in charge of this. He actually prophesied it all the way back in the days of Moses. But practically, besides trying to help them understand the big picture of what God is doing, the reality is if you were a God 
fearing Israelite, you were going to have some very specific, practical questions in the middle of all this politic, politics and in the middle of all these confusing times. You would have had some difficult decisions to make as Assyria fell, Babylon rose, and Egypt did what it did, and on and on. What should we do? Should we resist these foreign powers? Give in? How is God going to fulfill his promises when we seem so weak? The false prophets had one answer. Jeremiah said the opposite. And the prophet's answer was one that people liked, the false prophets. And Jeremiah's answer was one that they didn't like. And as a result, he found himself in constant conflict because he was telling the message that no one wanted to hear. Specifically, Jeremiah was looking at the Babylonians and he was saying, who is actually fighting against Israel? Jeremiah 21, 3 to 7. Listen for it. Then Jeremiah said to them, Thus you shall say to Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Behold, I will turn back the weapons of war that are in your hands and with which you are fighting against the king of Babylon and against the Chaldeans who are besieging you outside the walls, and I will bring them together into the midst of this city. I myself will fight against you with outstretched hand and strong arm in anger and in fury and in great wrath, and I will strike down the inhabitants of this city, both man and beast. They shall die of great wrath. Pestilence. Afterward, declares the Lord, I will give Zedekiah, king of Judah, and his servants, and the people in this city who survived the pestilence, sword, and famine, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, and into the hand of their enemies, into the hand of those who seek their lives. God, in other words, is telling uh, Judah, it's not just Nebuchadnezzar who's fighting against you, it's me. In fact, what does God call Nebuchadnezzar in Jeremiah 25 9 and Jeremiah 27 6? Behold, I will send for all the tribes of the north, declares the Lord, and for Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and I will bring them against this land and its inhabitants and against all these surrounding nations. I will devote them to destruction, and you remember that phrase, and make them a horror, a hissing, and an everlasting desolation. Who is Nebuchadnezzar? My servant. That's what God calls him. Now I've given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant, and I've also given him the beasts of the field to serve him. That's shocking. Nebuchadnezzar, this pagan king, God's servant, in his war against his own people. What will happen to Israel as a result, according to Jeremiah 25, 11 and 12 and 29, 10? This whole land shall become a ruin and a waste, and these nations shall serve the king of Babylon 70 years. Then after 70 years are completed, I will punish the king of Babylon and that nation, the land of the Chaldeans, for their iniquity, declares the Lord, making the land an everlasting waste. He's going to take his people into exile. And he actually says how long he's going to take them into exile. So what should they do in Babylon? And what should they do more specifically, excuse me, when Babylon attacks, according to Jeremiah 38? Jeremiah says to Zedekiah, Thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, the God of Israel, If you will surrender to the officials of the king of Babylon, then your life shall be spared, and this city shall not be burned with fire, and you and your house shall live. Jeremiah says, Surrender to my servant. Nebuchadnezzar. Given the choice, should they stay in the land or go to Babylon? According to Jeremiah 24, 4 through 10. Then the word of the Lord came to me, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, like these good figs, so I will regard as good the exiles from Judah, whom I've sent away from this place to the land of the Chaldeans. I will set my eyes on them for good, and I will bring them back to this land. I will build them up and not tear them down. I will plant them and not pluck them up. I will give them a heart to know that I am the Lord, and they shall be my people, and I will be their God, for they shall return to me with their whole heart. But thus says the Lord, like the bad figs that are so bad they cannot be eaten, so I will treat Zedekiah, the king of Judah, his officials, the remnant of Jerusalem who remain in the land, and those who dwell in the land of Egypt. I will make them a horror to all the kings of the kingdoms of the earth, to be a reproach, a byword, a taunt, and a curse in all the places where I shall drive them. Now, obviously, that was a shocking message. Surrender to Nebuchadnezzar. He's my servant. I'm the one warring against you. Go to Babylon. Leave the land. The people who actually leave the land are going to be blessed. The people who stay are going to be judged. That's a shocking, shocking message, which is why God makes it so clear at the beginning of this book that God had called Jeremiah to speak this very message. And this is pretty interesting. Whose words are we reading according to Jeremiah 1.1 and Jeremiah 51.64? If you look down, you'll see it says the words of Jeremiah. But what phrase do we see repeated in chapter 1 verse 4, 1 verse 11, and 1 verse 13? Now the word of the Lord. And the word of the Lord. The word of the Lord. As we look through 
Jeremiah, we'll see that phrase over and over again, and it's one of the keys to unpacking the whole book, actually. We're reading Jeremiah's words, which are God's words. After introducing us to Jeremiah as a person in verses 1 to 3 of chapter 1, we get to know him as a prophet in verses 4 and 5, and listen to these verses closely. He writes, Now the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you, and before you were born, I consecrated you. I appointed you as a prophet to the nations. Jeremiah, you have been known by God, you have been set apart by God, you have been appointed by God, you are a prophet to the nations. And this is happening, this was decided even before Jeremiah was born. So clearly, Jeremiah's life is about something much bigger than Jeremiah. As someone has said, Jeremiah was made into a word-shaped creature. He was being suited to be a container for the word of God. In fact, you might call Jeremiah a theologian of the word. This idea of the word of the Lord is all throughout the book. He uses the phrase, thus says the Lord, 157 times. Out of the total 349 times it's said in the entire Old Testament. This means half of the references to thus says the Lord are in Jeremiah. He's really wanting us to know that the word he speaks comes from God. Listen to Jeremiah 1.9 or You might look at it. Listen listen to how I I paraphrase this in my own words. It's almost like God says to Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1.9, I have a jug full of my words and I've poured them into you. You are going to be my voice. When you speak, your words are going to be my words. So Jeremiah and God's words are connected. And in a sense, Jeremiah represents the word of God throughout this whole book. When he speaks, we hear God speak. And because Jeremiah's whole life is so tied to the word of God, as we see people responding to Jeremiah, and as we hear Jeremiah speaking, it's not just about Jeremiah, it's about God. Check out how the following verses make this connection. Jeremiah 5.14 Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of hosts, because you have spoken this word, behold, I'm making my words in your mouth a fire, and this people would, and the fire shall consume them. Jeremiah 10.1 Hear the word that the Lord speaks to you, O house of Israel. That's Jeremiah speaking. Jeremiah 15, 16. Your words were found and I ate them and your words became to me a joy and the delight of my heart for I'm called by your name, O Lord God of hosts. Jeremiah 23, 18 and 22. For who among them has stood in the counsel of the Lord to see and hear his word or who has paid attention to his word and listened? Or Jeremiah 43, 1. When Jeremiah finished speaking to all the people, all these words of the Lord their God, with which the Lord their God had sent him to them. And I wanted you to see that or hear that because it helps us understand how Jeremiah works, the book. One man explains, the book of Jeremiah is a story, not just about the life of a prophet, but it's a story about the word of God. It's not just the life of Jeremiah, it's not just a biography of Jeremiah, but it's the story of what happens when the word of God becomes a fire in Jeremiah's bones. He begins to preach that and communicate that. And what happens to that word as it's going out? That's what we're reading Jeremiah to find out. Jeremiah, in a sense, becomes a living representation of the word of God. He becomes an embodiment of that word. And so the things that happen to Jeremiah, the various forms of persecution, the oppression, being thrown in a dungeon, being threatened with his life, it reflects how people react to the word of God. It's also the word of God that brings about the fall of Jerusalem. God fulfills his prophetic word, and then it's the word of God that gives hope to the people of Israel for their future because God has not abandoned them. And they're going to need that hope (laughs) because look at what the words God is putting in Jeremiah's mouth are intended to do. Jeremiah 1.10. These are words that pluck up and break down, destroy and overthrow, and then build and plant. Jeremiah 18, 7 and 9. Pluck and up and break down and destroy. Those phrases are found at key points in this book and that's because they really picture what Jeremiah is all about. It's about judgment, but it's also about salvation. You might say the book of Jeremiah is about the word of God bringing demolition to the people of Israel and then promising restoration. He's explaining why they had to be destroyed. And he's also pointing forward to the hope that God will restore them and explaining how he's going to do that, which we'll begin to look at in the videos that follow.